Hello all, I am Abigail Posner, part of the Global Business uh, Organization at Google, and I am so honored and pleased to be able to announce that in our presence, we have, well, virtual presence, we have Ellie Beer, founder and president of United Hatzalah's US operation. Now, Ellie has received so many accolades that I would probably have to take the full hour to share all of them, but just to name a few, he has been nominated the Young Global Leader at Davos, World Values Network Champion of Human Life Award, and the Victor J. Goldberg Prize for Peace in the Middle East. And plus, he has a wicked awesome TED Med talk to check out. So uh, I really am so pleased. Thank you so much. Here is Ellie Beer. Thank you, Ellie, for joining us. Tell us where you are right now. Well, I'm in this sunny, beautiful Florida. It was raining just before, but it's a beautiful state. And I'm in Boca Raton. Where do you normally live? I live in uh, on a plane. <laughs> uh, my, you know, my kids, uh, they see me more on a plane through, uh, you know, video communications than on the ground. So they call me, in Hebrew, it's called Avinu Shemaim, Sheba Shemaim, our father up in heaven. Right. Um, and that's how they call my kids. Always see the our father somewhere there, you know. Like so I'm traveling around the world usually. And and why are you traveling so much? Well, I travel because uh, I have a mission, and uh, I have to promote this mission everywhere I could. People should learn about it. People should copy it. People should um, uh, support it. And and actually, it's it's amazing to see that I go to places that never heard of what I do and. They say it's it's just the most simplest thing to do. Why don't we do it here? Why don't we copy it? Why don't we support it? And 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 I, that's why I do the traveling. And it's amazing to to meet new people all the time. And so, well, what I mean, is it that you do? Tell tell us about what United Hatzalah is. Well, if you think about it, it's like a it's like an Uber Uber free Uber system to save lives. Paramedics on motorcycles who are out, who, who are everywhere, thousands of them, or responding to emergencies that are nearby them, within 90 seconds, they get to the patient, they stabilize them, and just wait for an ambulance to show up to take the person to the hospital. That's the whole idea. It's uh -huh. paramedics like you and me, you could be trained, it takes a couple of months. Once you get trained, you get an app on your phone, and you do your daily thing. You could be in the middle of interviewing a head of a state, and a baby's choking nearby. You say, I'm so sorry. I have an emergency to respond to. You tell the head of the state, you say, Mr. Biden, Mr. Biden, President, I'll be right back. I'm going to save someone's life. And that's what it is. We do every day almost 2,000 emergencies responding as volunteers to emergencies. And uh, our average response time in many cities are under 90 seconds. And what's normal? What's a normal response time for ambulances? Well, I well, I don't know where you are now, but I, I just been to New York and I was yeah. stuck in a traffic uh, go, trying to go 10 blocks in New York on a, in a cab. It took me 35 minutes in a cab for 10 blocks. And I was so cold. I just said, I'm going to stay here with the heating. So I didn't leave, but I would have walked. It would have gotten a lot early, a lot faster. Ambulances get stuck in traffic every single day while people need them to be saved. Think about someone not breathing for five minutes. Right. No one could stop breathing for five minutes. What about 15 minutes? An average response time of ambulances in many cities are over 15 minutes. How many of the people watching this could stop breathing for more than a minute? And that's the idea of United Hatzala is I started this when I was 16 years old in order. And I realized ambulances are not there on time to save people. Ambulances are good for transport, but bad for saving. Interesting. Good for transport, but bad for saving because they take so long. Exactly. Ambulances take long because of the distance. You can't put an ambulance in every street. Um, right. It takes time for an ambulance to pass through the city. It takes time to pass through traffic. Ambulances, even if they put on these lights and sirens, people can't move. And you have a paramedic and a driver and an EMT and a doctor behind, inside the ambulance just sitting there. And they can't do nothing. But someone nearby, that person they're going to save, could be a paramedic, could be a nurse, could be an EMT, could be a doctor. So they need to be notified of something happening nearby them. Once they are, 
I, I, I can assume that if you are a trained EMT and you know about someone in trouble, you will stop everything you do and run, save them. And that's everyone. I, 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 the people I know, that's what we do. So the and collection I, of volunteers that you have that are dispersed across the cities around the world to be on call, on alert for uh, that 90 second travel to save someone's life. Are they all trained as EMTs? Yeah, everyone has a job. You know, some are plumbers, are lawyers, accountants, electricians. And once they said that we want to join, they have to go through a process of training. It's about a half a year training. They become certified EMTs. And then they get the medical supplies to the back of the car, to the trunk. So they can be like a, like a volunteer, undercover EMT. And they... Right. You go to movie, you go play golf, you go to work, you go home, and uh, we we alert you if something happens nearby you because our system, our technology knows to find the closest people to every emergency. Right. And we use 250 algorithms to to actually find the, not only the closest but the one who is the most trained for that situation. If let's say a baby is getting born in the middle of the highway, let's say the FDR now, a woman's on the way to hospital. I have, I have a baby in a hospital, but she's stuck in traffic and she needs help immediately because the baby's coming out. Her situation is a life-threatening situation. We will alert the closest volunteers who are midwives. And they might be, you, you might have a car, uh, three cars behind her, someone is a midwife running out of their car and running, rushing to her and saving her. Right. So I want to talk about the technology that you leverage to inform people and know where they are at any given moment and the types of vehicles that you use and to ensure that you get there with the, in that speedy time. But before we do that, I would love to, because you just started dipping your toe into this. And I, you said at 16, I, I had this epiphany and I would love for you to go back in time and just give us a sense of like how it struck you and led you to where you are today. And then we'll dig into the juicy tech stuff. All right. So I grew up in Jerusalem, and uh, my parents were Americans. That's why I spoke English at home. Um, and uh, when I was sixteen years, when I was fifteen years old, I decided I want to become a volunteer in an ambulance. I said, my dream is always to save people's lives. And I said, I'm going to be on a. I would be in the back of an ambulance. I'm going to go save people every day. And I, I took it really serious. And the first emergency call that we responded to was a lady having a heart attack. And it took us a long time. I remember I was like, I was anxious to get there already. It was like, I was in the back of the ambulance jumping from side to side. The driver was going on, uh, you know, he was going against the traffic sometimes. And, and it was very hard because being in the back of an ambulance, you, you really feel your stomach going up there and down there. But I was saying, I don't care if I have to vomit on the way. I'm going to get there and save this woman's life. And, I, and we got there eventually 20 minutes after. And we started performing CPR. And the family was there. And the, they were crying, save our mother, grandmother, whatever it was, so that we were trying everything we could. Eventually, a doctor shows up from another ambulance, uh, like a more advanced ambulance, that showed up a lot later. And he says, okay, there was nothing you could do. I'm pronouncing her dead. She's not alive anymore. And he put the monitor on her and everything. So I was, I was, I was devastated. Why, why didn't we save her? And this was the first call. And I was so disappointed. I came back home. I was crying. I told my father. My father said, don't worry. Go next week. You'll, you'll probably save someone again. You know, your next shift. And that's what happened from week after week for a year and a half. I never saved anyone. I helped many people. But in emergencies that were so difficult, like uh, life-threatening threatening emergencies, it was impossible to save anyone. Um, people not breathing. By the time we got there, we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't bring them back. And then we had a seven-year-old boy, a young little boy who was having lunch, and his mother saw him choke. He was eating a hot dog, and she, she called for help. She called an ambulance, and we were the ambulance that were responding to that emergency. And we had to come from one side of the city to the, in Jerusalem to another side of the city. And the roads are very narrow, so for us to go through was very hard. And by the time we got there, we, we heard the mother screaming from the top of the building, for help and we knew the situation would be terrible we got up there it was 21 minutes after we got the emergency call 
And we started performing CPR, the Heimlich, whatever we could do to save him. And um, two minutes later, a doctor who was walking his dog saw our ambulance parked downstairs. So he understood someone needs help. And he came upstairs to help us. And he said, I'm a doctor, emergency room doctor. I live nearby. What can I do to help? We told him what happened. So he was working with us for almost 30 minutes uh, trying to save this kid. And after 30 minutes of trying, he said, there was nothing we could do. Just bring a sheet to cover him. Well, that that emergency, um, that, that situation was the worst case I've ever been to. And I realized how terrible this thing was because he was two blocks away when this kid was stroking. And he did not know that he's stroking only after the ambulance arrived. That's when he realized. And I was saying to myself, that's where the epiphany came from. If this doctor would have known earlier, he would for sure would have come and saved him. It's so easy to save someone from choking. You just need to get there in time. Right. Right. And so time was uh, I decided of an I'm just leaving the ambulance. Right. Yes. And every second counts. You can reverse brain damage or death. And I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to start a response, a response team that will announce publicly every single emergency. So I tried convincing the ambulance organization to agree with me about it. And they said, no way, we're not going to announce. If someone calls for help, they're going to get an ambulance coming to them. We're not going to have anyone coming before an ambulance. So I was stuck. What do I do now? How do I get the emergency calls? And you know, it's raining now behind me, you see. Um, but I, I decided I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go and get emergency help by volunteers listening into the walkie-talkies of the ambulance system. So I bought, I bought a bunch of walkie-talkies from radio staff. It was like these scanners way before your time. And we were, we were just listening into the emergency calls of ambulances. And every time we had a call, we would just run there, stabilize the person, and then save their life. So that's how it started. Yeah. Now, how, how, have you, how have you upgraded from running on your legs and using walkie-talkies? You know what? what? I'm going to move inside. I'm going to okay. move inside because okay. of the terrain. I hope nope. everyone forgives me. I didn't realize. I'm just, I didn't realize how bad the weather could be here. No problem. I'm moving here. No problem. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in here. L.A. right now, and in L.A. the weather was horrendous. So maybe you're getting what we had. Okay, here I am. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry for the for the interrupting. No problem. So I was asking. You know, you obviously have this novel idea of we're going to connect with people wherever you know wherever they are and get them whoever's the closest to this destination, probably using their legs, right? So when did you migrate from a more sophisticated system of connection and different types of vehicles other than people's legs to get to uh, a, a sick person, a person in need. So the first person I actually responded to was a man who was hit by a car. And this is a story that changed my life. And I, uh, I actually saw the person, I heard the emergency call dispatched on the walkie talkie. We were like underground. We, we build a whole underground operation with walkie talkies. We were listening to their emergency calls and we would send alerts by pagers to the volunteers who wanted to be um, responding, and we, that's how we got that's how we got the emergencies alerted to, to the people. And we would run there or by foot or by car. And I got a call about a a, a, a man hit by a car, and it was thirty seconds away from me. I got there, and he was bleeding terribly from his neck. And I had no bandages on me. So I didn't know what to do, how to stop the bleeding. And I, and I decided I'm going to use my yarmulke, my yarmulke on my head. And I took it and I just pushed it in as much as I could. Yeah. You know, it's a religious, it's a religious, uh, um, I don't know how to call it. It's more of a religious thing to wear in your head for, for you know, Orthodox Jews wear it. But it was a good tool to use to save someone's life. And I stopped his bleeding that way. And it was unbelievable. The person started, you know, I stabilized him and the ambulance arrived. And after about uh, 25, 30 minutes, an ambulance came and took him to the hospital. And they got a phone call two days later and they said, Ellie, are you, are you, are you the kid that came to, to stop the bleeding of this person? 
Um, mm -hmm. So I said, yes. He says, my father woke up, my father woke up in the hospital uh, this morning and he wants to thank you for saving him. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever saved someone's life. And there was the best feeling in the world. So I decided if it worked, if it worked this, you know, this way with Yamaka and, uh, and a walkie talkie, let's make it more professional. So we went ahead and we bought some medical supplies. We bought some, um, bicycles and we started that way. We said, we're going to get there faster with bicycles. And eventually I said, you know what? The more volunteers we have, the faster we get to emergencies. It's like really a network of volunteers. And I said, I want to get motorcycles and turn ambulances into motorcycles. The two wheel ambulances actually turn motorcycles into ambulances. And that's how the whole movement started with 15 friends, my age, more or less into um, the most disruptive medical organization. And I don't, th I think in the world. Yeah. So you had, you started with a motorcycle, which you now call an ambu cycle, right? Is that the yeah. term? And then you also have, Correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm mispronouncing it. You have a, a mini Alliance and a foldable amb ambu car. Is that right? Talk to, us about the, talk to us about those vehicles. Look, we always think of how can we get there faster? Look, every mm -hmm. second counts, like you said, times is, is the essence. The whole reason of this organization existing is for another five seconds that we could save. Technology helps save lives because we could find out who are the closest volunteers to every emergency. We use Google Maps to know traffic, ways, you know, we use ways through our systems and Google, nice. which is, you know, it's part of the, your organization to connect to the closest volunteers who are nearby. But then we want to get them there fast with equipment. They need medical, they need a defibrillator. They need medical supplies. So how do you do that? So some, we give ambicycles, which are brilliant. This was like, we invented this. It was like amazing. It was never existing before. Uh, ambulance on two wheels. This right. is almost 30 years ago. Now we have 1,200 of them in Israel that we give, we allocate them to specific volunteers. They drive all day with it. They take it home. They're allowed to use it for their own use. But if something happens, they have to respond. In some places, we look for other solutions like this new vehicle that was developed now in Israel that actually could turn, it could go narrow and it could go wide. So if you want to drive fast, it goes wide. The wheels come out. So you can go 80 miles an hour if you need to. But then when you have to go in between cars because there is no room, it just becomes narrow like a motorcycle. Super cool. And you have room for two paramedics, so one behind each other and medical supplies behind that. So it's really a long car with expandable wheels. And they are developing it now where the first – we're the first organization to start using them soon. And we have tractors, special tractors that we outfitted like ambulances so we could go off road to mountains or beaches where people get injured and we don't have to waste time waiting for people to carry these patients for sometimes an hour. Right. We could get them out. So we always think about new, we're going to, we're working on a drone system that will help. We're working, we have a whole team working on drones, which could be very helpful. Um, and we're always, the, the organization's DNA is people, technology, and, you know, different types of vehicles. So these three together connect and, uh, and make it so successful. So talk to us about the technology and how you can connect so seamlessly with the uh, lifesavers around you. You said you use uh, Google tools, but you, I, I know you have names for your, your particular technology, like the Life Compass 2.0 system. You have um, something else called Bluebird, I believe. Can you talk about how they all integrate? Um, okay, so we have the Life Compass um, Moskowitz technology, which is unbelievable. That's the first ones we actually developed on our own before, this is before iPhones were out there. This is before wow. smartphones. Wow. We developed it for the Java system. Look, originally when I started this uh, organization, I wanted to save a lot of time by announcing emergencies nationally. I was like, my idea was to ask the ambulance service to share emergency with us, and we will have someone near the – It was I was a kid, so I was like dreaming of how it looked. 
I said I want him to have the national radio uh, in in Israel should stop broadcasting every time a serious emergency happens. You know, you know the Amber Alert, right? When yep. God forbid someone is kidnapped, yeah, the Amber yells out to everyone. I wanted to build an Amber Alert for every emergency. Why only when a kid is 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 kidnapped and not when a kid is choking or a mm-hmm. kid is in the pool or someone is run over by a car or someone is having a heart attack and he's in a cardiac arrest. I want to do an Amber Alert for everything. That's That was my idea. So how do you do that? And I was trying to figure out ways 32 years ago how to do that. And I started with walkie talkies, which was the technology we had then. Um, I, my favorite store in the world was Radio Shack when I was a kid. So that's I used to buy walkie talkies, scanners all day, and then pagers. And that was like stupid technology, like simple technology. Then 15 years, 16 years ago, I saw the opportunity. One of my guys came over to me and he says, listen, Ellie, they have GPS in phones. I said, what are you talking about? I, we used to have these big GPS things that cost like a lot of money. And it was never really so good, but it was okay. It was these old things you connect to your car. And he says, now they're putting it in your phone. In the Nokia, they had in the Java systems of uh, Nextels, they had that. So I said, if they have it there, why don't we connect our volunteers to every emergency, basically, according to the, their location, their GPS location, their coordinates. And uh, I didn't have money to do it. It was a lot of money to develop this. I went over to a couple of companies. It was a million dollars to do this. Wow. So I went over to a sweet sweet lady living in Florida, Miami, and I asked her if she could give us a million dollars to develop this. And I said, this is gonna this is gonna change the way emergencies are responded. People use stupid technologies to locate close people. Let's make it more efficient. And I said, I need a million dollars to do this. And, and how this old lady, were you? How old were you at this time? No, this is uh I was thirty years old. Okay. You're still still a baby ish. Yeah. Still a baby ish. Yeah. 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 Okay. You'll see in a couple of years when you get when you get become thirty. Uh, right. Get... <laughs> How did you know? Right. <laughs> so I uh, I actually went to her. Her name is Karen Moskowitz, and she said right away, "Take the million dollars and develop this." This sounds like I I had a hard time explaining it because she wasn't you know she was a lot older than I was. Yeah. But she got it right away, and she said, "I'm in." And we developed the first technology in the world to locate this. We could have developed Uber. We could have developed anything else. And don't forget, Waze started way behind after us. Even Google Maps started after us. Wow. It wasn't on any, no one had on the phone a Google Map. So we actually started this. We bought from Google license. It wasn't Google. It was another company in Israel then who sold you a license on every phone, like a few dollars to have that map. But that's how we did it. And this this is how we started developing it. And I said to my guys, technology will always be United and Sellers first thing we in, we invest in. And that's how we're going to save more lives. And and now we have another technology called Carbine, which when someone calls us and they don't know where they are, immediately we send a text message to them and through WhatsApp and through text messaging. So they get it and they press the they press it and automatically their phone opens up a camera an audio, and a location. Wow. So we see their exact location. We see everything going around them. We could help them do perform. We had during Hanukkah last week in Israel, his family was on some vacation retreat or somewhere, and the grandfather was having a, a big donut for Hanukkah. And uh, he choked. Oh, and they called. And they didn't know where they were, number one. Number two, the, the grandfather was choking. He was completely, no, he wasn't breathing. They didn't know what to right. do. So our dispatch told him, press the link we just sent you. They did. And he saw the guy is choking. He saw exactly where they are. So we sent people straight to them right away. We had a volunteer who was a minute away. Yeah. But even before the volunteer arrived, the family were performing Heimlich maneuver that, that they just got instructions from the person by looking on video, a two-way video to the dispatch. So they were able to, to do performing the uh, Heimlich maneuver. And when the volunteer arrived, this person was saved already. Wow. That's wonderful. So, so wow. technology is, a, I, I recommend if you like technology, come visit us. We have a really 
incredible place to show. Yeah. Well, you're clearly super innovative, um, ahead of the curve in so many ways. And you're in a field, and you mentioned this before, you, you're in a field healthcare, which, you know, it may not be as technologically innovative as, as some other fields. So what lessons can you help us with, uh, particularly for the folks from Google Health, to gain from how you were able to penetrate this world of healthcare with innovation? So first of all, I, I think this the solutions for a lot of health problems are right next to you. Sometimes you look for solutions that are so difficult to find, so far away from you, when you have a solution right next to you and you could find it for a lot of things. I, I took it for the emergency medical response. Look, an ambicycle is the most simplest thing in the world. It's so easy. Yeah. We treated it with our ambicycles over 5 million people. Hundreds of thousands of people were saved because of these ambicycles. So simple. Sometimes you're trying to save people and you look and you put in millions and millions and millions of dollars in research for things that you could find solutions that are there already and you just have to think out of the box. And I, I always say use some chutzpah, Israeli chutzpah. Yeah. And create it. Look, I see in New York City, I, I'm in New York all the time. And I see traffic and I see ambulances, trucks, fire trucks are going to save someone from dying. A fire truck with um, a huge, huge truck trying to fight traffic in New York for someone with a cardiac arrest while uh, someone with a bicycle could get there faster. And a little motor on the bicycle, like we could call it an ambicycle, an ambibike. And they don't think about it. I don't know why. Why don't they do it? It doesn't yeah. doesn't make sense to me when yeah. I see these things. So you have so many solutions that are simple and just you have to want to change things. You want to change uh, ways of behavior. And uh, I, I just don't know what else I could recommend but just looking around you and saying, you know what, let's use this. This just makes sense. Well, it sounds like you're also driven by a strong sense of passion. And um, obviously, saving lives that is something you can one can be passionate about i mean what what other more important role in life can you have but there's something else that i've i've seen your company or your your team do um that's quite impressive um and meaningful which is save everybody's lives right i mean i love the fact that you have the, the name united hatsala because it doesn't matter Female, male, Arab, Jewish, right? Talk to us about that. That it's it, it. You're agnostic to the types of people. It's all about saving any person. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. You know, when I started this, it was uh, created in, in my community in Jerusalem, which is an Orthodox Orthodox Jewish community, and uh, we knew each other. We were old friends from school, from synagogue, and and then when it started growing and I realized that other people want to join us, I said, it can't be like, we're like, we never had any friends from outside of our community in Israel. Everything is like, you know, your community, your city, your people, your religion, everyone. So I, I so I one day get a phone call from a, two Arabs in, in, in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. They said they want to meet me about it. And I said, what is it about? They want to, they want a private meeting. So I met with them and they said, um, you know, his father, this guy, Muhammad's father, he was, had a cardiac arrest, 52 years old, laying on the floor there, calling for an ambulance. The ambulance took for almost an hour to arrive, one hour. And he saw his father die in front of his eyes. And he said to himself, I'm going to learn how to save lives and honor my father. And I'm going to save people like my father. And he was looking how to do it. He had a problem. He, had to, he wanted to save his father. He didn't know what to do. He says, I'm going to say, I'm going to learn how to do this and save other people. And he said, I want to be part of your team of Hatzalah, what's called Hatzalah. Hatzalah means saving, rescuing in Hebrew. So um, I said, um, I had chills in my body. I said, you know what, Muhammad? I'll, I'll, I'll join you in, in one condition. Get me 25 more people like you. And this was one of the greatest days of my life, meeting a group of Arabs, mostly Muslim, but also some Christian Arabs in one room. And we were just talking about how could we save lives? 
not about nothing else, not politics, not about Israel land, not land, not about nothing controversial, just saving lives of parents, of children, of women, of people who need us. And I gave him the whole spiel, the whole idea. In Yiddish, it's called spiel. Right. I told them the whole idea. They loved it. I remember, you know, these people came from a different type of mentality. The American mentality is volunteering and everything. People love volunteering. So is the Israeli. And our mentality then was not so familiar with the whole volunteering movement. So I remember one of these new young volunteers that wanted to join. He says, uh, I have a question for you. I said, what is it? He says, I'm so excited about volunteering. How much money are we making from volunteering? So I said, I'm not only you're not going to make any money, you're going to spend money on volunteering. It's going to cost you money to volunteer. Gasoline, you're going to pay from your own pocket every time you go to save someone. You're not going to get any expenses back. You're going to lose money by, if you have a job, you're going to lose money by going to help people. And when he heard that, he said, wow, I'm in. I'm in. I want to be in. And I realized People want to be heroes. People want to help. People want the opportunity. That, that, that Everyone wants the opportunity to, to be a hero. And I think this is the greatest organization that brings people together in Israel and in other places too. But Israel is where we started uh, this movement of volunteers that come from different backgrounds, different Jewish backgrounds, different non-Jewish backgrounds, men and women, and different, not only in different Social, social economy, uh, economy of backgrounds. Some people are very simple, can hardly make a living, and other people are very successful business. And they all together, they go and save lives together. They become best friends and they help people. They, it's it's just incredible to see. I think that's the greatest added value that happened to the organization. Yeah. And so how, you were mentioning that you're around the world. How are other countries, other cultures responding to your enterprise? Well, I I always wanted this to be everywhere. So I'm, I just speak about it, lecture. I put a lot of time into, I feel like I'm a, I'm creating a new religion. Um, How so? And, yeah, I, 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 I lecture. I'm like a missionary about this. I'm like, <laughs> right. I'm like Jesus. I'm working around creating new religion here, saving lives, you know? I'm like, I go from city to city. I go for a synagogue. I go to a mosque. I go to a church. I go everywhere. Just saying, you could save a life if you build this organization in your community. And I help many communities around the world to create this. I don't run it or all these places that I help start is on their own. They just have to learn from us. They come to Israel. They learn. So it's like a franchise. It's not really a franchise. It's not like... You know, we're not McDonald's. We're not trying to make money from from franchising. It, w- it wouldn't be a bad idea, but it's actually a volunteer system that you could build everywhere. So I don't know where you live. Let's say you live in San Francisco. This could, You could create this in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Uh, every Jewish community in the world has it now, besides mm-hmm. for maybe a few. But the idea is that you could take this. We I brought it into Jersey City, the mayor, Philip, uh, together with my chairman, Mark Gerson, they decided they want to bring it there to Jersey City. We trained the people. We helped the people. We got through the bureaucracy with the unions, with everyone. They all agreed this is a good thing. Can we talk about that? Because it sounds easy peasy when you say it, but you're working with a large uh, uh, group of very diverse types of people, public bureaucracies, different countries. I mean, how do you get them to all go, yes? And let's integrate your dispatching systems. I mean, how do you how do you make them all align? It's tough. That's the hardest thing in the whole thing because don't forget we're disrupting a system. Yeah. And no one wants a change. I'm just going to take a few examples. I don't know Google. I'll take Google as an example. You know, before Google, if I wanted to learn anything about, um, if I wanted to learn anything about. Anything, I had to go to a library to learn. I had to spend hours and hours in a library, pay a library to let me in, and go through hundreds of books to find something, right? Look what we have now. Google is one of the products you have. is a search engine. And anyone can just open a phone or open a computer and search for anything you want for free. 
that was a disruptive idea. I'm sure the libraries were not happy about Google taking all the books and putting it publicly there, or all the knowledge publicly. A lot of people were not happy. I took Google as an example, but take Uber as an example. When right. Uber started, or Lyft, and all these all these share uh, share ride ride shares, you know, traditional taxi companies were not happy. You know, they were like, and you couldn't complain if you had to wait twenty five minutes for a cab to go to the airport and even see plane. Who are you going to complain to? Today, you have so many more options on your phone. United Atzala is a disruptive organization. Ambulance organization in Israel were not happy that we came in and we offered a free and fast professional service. But they had to get used to it. And that was part of the building of the thing. Don't think it's just, oh, they're going to dance and, and celebrate your day of coming into the city. No, right. they have. They are very tough. I know we're talking, talking about saving lives, and I'm sure they like saving lives too, but they think saving lives should be supervised by them. Right. Their domain. And no one else should touch their turf. That's I remember having a meeting with them in Israel. And they said, all these people that you're running to save, these are our clients. I said, they're not your clients. They're human beings who need to be saved. Don't look at it as clients. Yes, they do serve charge for service, so they look at it as clients, but they're not clients. They're people who are in the worst situation of their life. When, they, when someone calls for help, this is not because they just aboard they have no other choice and they need someone coming i heard today they had a meeting in the knesset the israeli parliament about united Hatzalah, and it's still we still have problems there in israel serious problems they still we get there so fast sometimes people don't need an ambulance afterwards they they say we feel better no no they don't need for an ambulance so they they lose a transport think about it if, if you're choking, God forbid, and I come over to you and I do a Heimlich maneuver on you, you're fine. You don't need to go to hospital. So think how many people are losing out here. Now, I'm sure people will be happy to save, but if it happens every day hundreds of times, it's it's disrupting the system. So we actually, you know, sat in, we met in the Knesset. My guys in Israel is trying to say, you know what? We want to make a one system to my dream is when something happens, throw it in the air. Whoever could get there first, just get it. it. The information about sick people doesn't belong to anyone. It belongs to the public. And that's my goal, to make life-threatening emergencies everyone's responsibility. So how did you overcome the challenges? That, you know, you, you're referencing challenges that you're still trying to deal with. How did you overcome right. the challenges in the case of, let's say, the Jersey City bureaucratic system? What was the way in? Well, in that case, we had we were lucky because the mayor, the mayor of Jersey City, Mayor Phillip, told the ambulance EMS service that if you're not going to let this organization start training people and they're not going to help us, they're not going to win the tender. Mm -hmm. So in Jersey City, they have a tender every few years, and that was one of the conditions. So it was easy. Yeah, but they didn't talks. want it. Of course not. They didn't want it. It's a headache for them. It's it's really a headache because all of a sudden you have hundreds of people right. wearing these vests who are showing up in emergency calls. And you, it's not really, you know, they don't want to see it. They don't want uh, honestly, they want to be controlling everything. But you and did such did, a good job convincing that mayor. How did you do that? Well, he was close friend with Mark Gerson, our chairman, and he loved what we were doing in Israel. And he actually, he said, I want everything. He they had, a, they had a story in Jersey City of a man who had a heart attack. Three o'clock in the morning, it was a, a blizzard outside. It was freezing. It was snow. It took three and a half hours to get to him with an ambulance. And he, he didn't survive. And they had two first responders who lived across the street. And they were best friends with him. They didn't know. Because the wife called for help, crying for the 911 to come. And they couldn't come because of the blizzard. They just couldn't make it. But they had two first responders who lived across the street and could have saved his life. Right. It was a young man. And that's the idea. 
we want to make it the public's responsibility. Yeah. So, you know, you obviously have these big dreams. That's the way you talk about it. You're like, my dream is that everybody, whoever they can, should respond to a life-threatening situation, no matter if you're from the ambulance world or you're from United Had Solo world. You have this sense of passion. You have this sense of chutzpah, right, that has really kind of propelled you since you were 16. This is a hard question, but how do we, as regular humans, how do we, yeah, we work at Google and, and beyond, but like, how, how do we kind of like tap into that sense of chutzpah and, and really make sure that it drives us? Well, I was thinking where the chutzpah mentality came from to the Israeli people. We have it in our blood. I think it's a Jewish thing, but it's more Israeli Jewish thing. Chutzpah is, I just want to explain a lot of people who don't understand what chutzpah is. Uh, I, I was in India two years ago giving a, a, a TEDx talk there in India, and I, I found the word for chutzpah in India. They have that there. They have it. How would you explain chutzpah? How would I? Yeah. I would say it's a sense of, um, it, it's passion meets uh, a bit of, uh, you know, daredevilness, right? Like uh, that I will, I have a belief, I feel con I have a lot of conviction around it and I'm just going to go for it no matter the reaction. I think they have a word for it, but it's not a common word in English. But in, in Israel, it's like the most common word. Like we don't take no for an answer. If this is the right thing to do, we're going to do it no matter what. So if you say no, we're not going to let you say, okay, you don't want to help? You don't want to open the door, we'll get there through the window. Right. Brazenness. Of, Brazenness. Maybe that's the word. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I, I'm sure a lot of people are listening to us are probably coming up with words. And uh, if they have a way to share it, it'll be great. Because I always trying to figure out how do you say chutzpah in English. But it's really, we're not going to let some bureaucracy stop a dream that could change the world. And it's about a lot of things. I think Google is a great example. I think Google had a chutzpah. And I think everyone in Google always wants to come up with the next thing and build something that's... That a lot of people say, no, don't do it. It's not going to, you know, like, and you go, and you guys do it. You have so many companies. I don't even know how many hundreds of ideas that was were created by you guys. And it, even this, this is chutzpah, you know, that this broadcast here. It used to belong only to CNN, Fox News, and everything. And now look at it. You yeah. created your own show. Right. And you're stealing away time from other people. They were under networks. They used to own our time, our, when we used to open the TV. I don't open TVs anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, who watches TV anymore? I mean, you still have some movies you want to watch or shows, but it became so, you know, you just say, you know what? I'm just going to create my own, do it, and I'm not going to let anyone stop me. And this is what United to Tell is all about. And I think anyone who's watching this show has a dream to do. They want to do something. They want to create something. And they, and they get stuck because of people telling them, no, it's stupid, don't do it, it's crazy, you're going to get sued, you're going to get this, you're going to that. Don't let things, if it's a good thing, don't let things stop you and fight for it. Yeah. I, I'm fighting for it for 32 years, and it's a fight. It's a battle. Not only that we succeeded with what we did, the ambulance services started copying us because they saw they had no other choice. They started buying motorcycles, too. And they started buying, they started creating technologies. So we actually created an environment of competition in saving lives so now people get help much faster if it's not always us it right. could be other people right. but it's creating something like since um you know uber started so they had lyft and other companies that started after i don't know who started first whatever it is it just created now a much better service for the people yeah because everybody's trying to build better and better and better and, and i have to say uh we at google were super inspired um, and, uh, uh, you know, just love the passion and love what you stand for. So hot off the presses, before we even get to the juicy questions that are coming your way, I just want you to know that the Jewish community inside Google, we call us, we call ourselves the Jugglers, have mm -hmm. raised enough money to donate an AmbuCycle to wow. your array of amazing.
amazing vehicles. So look out for it. And we're so excited to be part of your amazing organization and to save more lives. So thank you for inviting us into that, that experience. That um, is amazing. I, first of all, I want to say, I salute you. I love you guys. And uh, I just say that this is amazing. This is our first Google cycle. We're called the Google cycle, which is going to be displayed and saving lives in your behalf. And we're going to send you updates about it. So when it saves somebody, you'll get notice. Oh, that's about awesome. it. So you can share with everyone in the community. It's just amazing because this was my dream. And I never knew this dream is so big. Honestly, when I thought about it, and this is so important, I just wanted to solve my my problem in my neighborhood. I didn't think about solving Jerusalem or the whole country. Right. So start small. Start small. Really, yeah. start small. People say, I want to change the world. They're never going to get anywhere. Just change yourself. Change your community. Change mm. your school. Change whatever you want to do. And this will help growing. If it's good, it's going to just grow. Right. And I and really inspire more it. people. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of inspired people, I, I would love to allow folks to ask some questions. So I'm opening up the this wonderful conversation, though I could ask you questions for another few years, but uh, I do want to give others um, their time in the sun to ask you some questions. So, uh, team, do you want to hit me? With you know what? Answer? You didn't ask me. You don't oh. know. What, you don't know what you didn't ask me. What didn't I ask you? This is the first podcast I'm getting questions, but no one asked me about COVID. Interesting. Wait, maybe someone can ask a question about COVID. So note, note to the audience, someone should ask a question about COVID. But I do hear, I do see a great question from Sandeep. Uh, great idea. What about the legal challenges? Ooh, what if the local personnel offering medical help makes an error? By the way, I am not surprised. This is the first question in the United States. It doesn't happen in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> This is now I know most of your audience are in America. And yes, it is a challenge in America, but it's not a challenge in most of the, in, like in Israel, no, because we have a good Samaritan law. And in America, they have the good Samaritan law as well. So if your intention is to come help and you're, you're trained, you are protected by the good Samaritan law. And we were, we treated over 5 million people and we, we didn't, we never got sued. Because people know they can win a case. We came in good intentions. Yes, we do mistakes. But we're not making money off it. We didn't come to service you and send you a bill. So that's why hospitals and doctors in hospitals, they're good people. They get they get sued because they get paid for it. Right. And we don't get paid. And, and that's what that what, that's what protects us. So this could be protecting people here in America, too. Got it. Uh, another question from the audience. Okay, from Sarah. The way you got started listening to ambulance scanners via walkie-talkies is a form of rule-breaking, indeed. Uh, are there any currently unquestioned rules that you would break in order to help people? Uh, well, she has chutzpah. Um, yeah, she's, she's great, Sarah. Thanks for this question. Yeah, I, I did this when I was 17 years old. When I started the ambulance cycle, or first, sorry, when I started the walkie-talkie um, underground uh, operation, it was, I was 16 years old. I told my friends, listen, if they catch me, the worst case they'll do is, you know, they can't put me in jail. I'm too young to go to jail. So, but now I'm older, I'm 19 already. Um, uh, so, but I'm, I'm, I actually have the same mentality. I, I can tell you that ambicycles, when we started the ambicycles, it was the most, it was the best thing we ever did in terms of, you know, transportation. But people said to me, we have to get permission from the government first. We have to go through all this bureaucracy with the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of this. You know, in Israel, you can, you, you can work 90 years to get permission for anything. So I said, <laughs> guys, I know how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to do it. And if you and don't, ask, don't ask for permission. And if you get caught, you ask for forgiveness. And that's what we did. And we started the ambicycle unit and we made it official looking with lights and sirens and everything. And the police thought we were official, which was great for a few years. No one asked questions. <laughs> I, I honestly, like they didn't think we have enough chutzpah to do that. We just build this. So you fake it till you make it. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I'm telling a secret here. This is a secret. This is like a, you have a scoop here. And I, I actually, years after, maybe 10 years after, we, we, we licensed the organization's license sirens issue on motorcycles. But it was after a fact was made. Like, this is, we had proof of concept. Mm. And we brought it in. And we still do that. A lot of things. I sometimes I tell my guys, we can't work always by the rules. Because the rules, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. That's situation now, EpiPens. I hate the company who make EpiPens. I don't know if they could sue me for saying that, but I don't like them. They have a monopoly. And they were sued, by the way, a, a whole long story. I'm on Google now, so I don't know if I could say this, but I don't like the way they be. It's so expensive to buy an EpiPen. We need to buy EpiPens that have to, we have to buy 6,000 EpiPens a year for our volunteers in order to have good response because sometimes people have allergic reactions mm -hmm. and we don't have EpiPens that are expired. Every year we have to throw away the expiration, the ones that are expired. Yeah. What do you do? So I want to create my own, but the Israeli government says, no, this and that. I said, I want to take an adrenaline, like the little bottle of adrenaline, and put like these two, um, like create our own kit, which costs a dollar. And I'm fighting for it now to do it without, like our doctors in the organization say, great idea. I said, we could, you know, like the little syringes that they give the vaccinations and you could, you could actually create for every EMT to have EpiPens, but not really EpiPens. There'll be adrenaline, which is the same exact thing to have that they have, but it's not like a automatic thing. You have to do it on your own. Right. which we could train people for and save more lives. And that's my next revolution that I'm doing in Israel. And we're going to be the first, and hopefully America will follow us. And all paramedics could carry uh, in their pockets adrenaline with right. a little syringe. Not only paramedics, EMTs as well. Right. Because paramedics right. could do that, but EMTs so should do that. This is another example of you saying you don't have to create something, you know, uber rev revolutionary to be revolutionary, right? I mean, this was something right. that was a very clear issue. EpiPens are expensive. How do we create a solution that is less expensive, easy to carry, and will work instantaneously? Um, and it wasn't something that you had to, you know, invest bazillions of dollars to, to, to figure out. So that's pretty cool. Again, just reinforcing the fact that sometimes you just have to switch the, the angle of, of, of how you look at something to, to come up with right. a, a novel but solution. The bureaucracy, by the way, could kill it because the bureaucracy, the people yeah. in the Ministry of Health, they would say, no, we need to use official things. If you're not a paramedic, you can't use a syringe. Well, guess what? All our people are vaccinating now people with syringes that they were just trained for two hours how to do it. So we could train them for four hours how to use uh, uh, adrenaline and, and let them use it for, for no one's going to die from it. They're going to save lives with it. So it's a it's a it's bureaucracy. Sometimes you need to know how to fight it and how to have chutzpah. And even now, when I'm 48 years old, I have to continue with it because, and I may continue it forever. Right. A uh, few other questions before we have to let Ellie go. Okay, Gil asked. Aside from emergency responders, which other organizations or groups did you face resistance from when introducing your concept? Oh, um, I didn't have any resistance from any organization besides for ambulances. I think everyone, everyone just loves it. I mean, people turn to us, even, even the ambulance services, the people there are wonderful and they're, they're our employees and the people there love us. We, we get along very well. It's not them. It's the people on top. So we, we're there to do good when no one's resisting us besides for the people on, on the top. We we'll look at it as a, you know, something that's you know losing control over their turf in their turf. I think maybe one. I don't. I can't even think of anyone, honestly. And, and we have love from left to right, from most everyone. Around, I live in Israel, and you'll never find an organization that's loved so much like United Hatzalah. Right. That's wonderful to hear. Any other questions? I think we had one last one. Carolyn asked, how has UH dealt with COVID in Israel? There you go. We got the COVID question in. Woohoo. Okay, so I just want to say a short thing. I was I was in a coma a year and a half ago. I don't know if you know, 
but I nearly died from COVID. I, I, I was one of the first to receive COVID March, 2020. Wow. I, I was actually flying from, I don't know where I came from England. I was in, I was in Washington, England, New York. And then I went to Miami and uh, I got sick and I didn't know what it was. No one knew what it was. It was March. Yeah. Ended up in University of Miami Hospital and they had to intubate me and put me in a coma for a month. And I had a 5% chance of survival. So I personally went through a tremendous miracle. This was a, the, you could, you could see videos about me. I, I sent out a video before they, before I died. Wow. I felt like I'm dying and I actually sent out a video to all my friends, you know, do good deeds for me and incredible what people were doing all around the world. People from in India, Hindus were praying for me and good, doing good deeds for me. In Israel, Arabs and Jews were doing praying for me and doing the good deeds in America, everywhere in Europe. And I woke up a month later and I was saved. So I personally, I'm lucky to be alive and I'm so careful, but I have to go back to life. Like I'm, I'm for going back to life, but take the, take the minimum things you could protect yourself with. And I recommend and Israel is for it to take the vaccinations. It's, you know, I don't own any stocks and any vaccination stock, uh, stocks, but I think it's it's the minimum we could do. It's not the best solution, but it's much, much, much better than getting sick. And I still suffer from it. So Israel went through four waves of COVID, and it was very tough because by us, when someone dies, everyone knows that person. Mm-hmm. America is so big, so when someone dies, you don't know, even know who that person is. When you know that person, it's harder. It's much. Israel, we had seven, seven and a half thousand people dying from COVID last year and a half, and everyone knows a few people who died from COVID, so it's much harder. And we took it serious in the lockdowns and crazy lockdowns in Israel. And now, okay, so I just recommend, you know, do the minimum and take the vaccination. It's not so bad. Trust me. Doesn't you don't even feel it? And sometimes you have a little reaction to it, but it's not so bad. Because I went through it, I don't, I can't argue with people who are against vaccinations, but I, I, because I'm not, I don't, it's not my business. I don't sell vaccinations, but I really think that it could happen to every one of us. And even people who are sick like me could get sick again, which is happening. So please be careful. I love you all because now we're one mishpucha, like we yeah. say. And I recommend it as Mishpocha recommendation. Well, thank you so much, Ellie, for uh, your advice on COVID, for what you're doing for the world in terms of getting to folks as fast as possible to save their lives and instigating this sense of uh, chutzpah dickness, if you will, amongst the whole medical community. So we all can up our game, get to folks faster, save their lives faster, and do it in a way that is united and divorced of any political issues um, and that we're all together. Like you said, we're all this mishpacha, mishpacha and um, you inspired us in so many ways. So thank you for giving thank us you. your time. Um, we're so excited about uh, your program and please keep us in the loop on any new amazing dreams and innovations that you have brought to life. Thank you, and, I, and I, you could Google us by the way, Great. United Hatzala. Our website is is there uh, Hatzala, by the way, is pronounced H A T Z A L A H, not Hezbollah. Many people make that mistake. Mm. Uh, that's another organization in Lebanon. They don't like us too much. Um, and uh, IsraelRescue.org is our website if you want to learn more and see some information. I I I, I can't thank you enough for that ambu cycle. This is going to be great. I want to do a lot. I want to do. Like a short a segment with you in Israel, driving that ambulance cycle and dedicating it. That would be That's the fun. Next one. That would be fun. And by the way, for the rest of the community who is watching, we have a go link, which is go slash Israel dash rescue. So if you want to know more information about that, uh, you can also go there. Um, again, thank you to everyone who's listened, who's asked questions. And Ellie, again, thank you so and much if you for have all people, that you do. If you have people in Miami, Sunday, we have a gala oh. with... Gypsy King is going to be there and God El Baz. And we have Cheryl Sandberg speaking. So if anyone wants to come, you know, I'm sure they'll find us. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, have a wonderful Wednesday all and uh, 
Enjoy going back to your Google work. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye-bye.